organizations. The colonized did not simply erect defensive walls around their notions of cultural difference in Asia. They were keen to be players in broad arenas of cosmopolitan hot zones and wished to contribute to the shaping of a global future. Their cosmopolitanism flowed not from the stratosphere of abstract reason, but from the fertile ground of local knowledge and learning in the vernacular. Universalism, cosmopolitanism, and internationalism are words and concepts jostling for interpretive space in new global, interregional, and transnational histories. Different universalism, in my connotation of the phrase, shares significant common ground with the meaning of vernacular cosmopolitanism, as evoked by my colleague Homi Bhabha, or local cosmopolitanism, as enunciated by Eng Seng Ho, in his wonderful book, The Graves of Tari, it's about the Hadrami migration uh, to Southeast Asia, or rooted cosmopolitanism, as described by Anthony Apai. Both notions of universalism with a difference and cosmopolitanism springing from vernacular roots are at odds with the dominant discourse and debates within the circle of contemporary British and North American analytical philosophy. There are champions of cosmopolitanism who see detached reason as its only source, and they display a visceral distaste for patriotism, confusing it with narrow particularism. Colorless cosmopolitanism is assigned a high moral ground, for example, by Martha Nussbaum. Colorful patriotism is deemed to be seductive, but devoid of any ethical content. A figure like Rabindranath Tagore can be annexed to this version of cosmopolitanism only by denuding him of much of his poetry and music and all of his passion and moral philosophy. Tagore was a powerful critic of worshipping the nation as God and was horrified by the crimes committed by modern nation states. Yet he loved the land that had nurtured him and never abandoned an anti-colonial stance. He simply did not want Indian patriots to imitate European nationalists. And it is not without reason that Mahatma Gandhi, in his obituary comment on Tagore in 1941, lauded the poet as an ardent nationalist. The large ethical claims made by votaries of a brand of cosmopolitanism that is dogmatically opposed to patriotism need to be put to the test on the ground of the history of colonial empire. Cosmopolitanism would serve as a weak pillar of any theory of human justice if it ruled out as illegitimate most modes of anti-colonial resistance. Fortunately for the idea, that was not the dominant kind of cosmopolitanism that animated Asia in the age of global empire. There were various forms of patriotism perfectly compatible with a cosmopolitan attitude that transcended the lines of particular cultural differences. Within the terms of the Anglophone philosophical debate, the opposition to cosmopolitanism based on abstract universal reason is articulated by proponents of reason embedded in inherited traditions. For example, the philosopher Hilary Putnam does that. A useful enough corrective to the excesses of colorless cosmopolitanism, this intellectual position falters because of its insistence on the bounded and implicitly unchanging nature of inheritances from the past. It fails to bring to light the dynamic process of creating and recreating traditions, as well as the flows between cultures and the fluidity of cultural boundaries. The history of colorful cosmopolitanism, if I may coin that phrase, rather than the legacy of the dead weight of traditions, might be a better antidote to the philosophical hubris of the votaries of colorless cosmopolitanism. The Vice Chancellor wanted me to mention Europe. Now, in order to contest the universalist boasts of Europe, it is important on both conceptual and empirical grounds to recover the universalist aspirations emanating from Asia. For scholars of literature or textual tradition, an evocation of cosmopolitanism in the sense of a generous exchange beyond narrow particularisms, qualified by the linguistic and cultural specificity of the vernacular, may be a sufficiently deft semantic move. For modern historians, however, universalism animates a field of power 
that cannot be abandoned. It can only be inflected by the countervailing energy of difference. The argument about the colonized world, particularly in Asia, as a fount of different universalisms can be made over a long period of history, but needs to be advanced more forcefully for the few decades spanning the late 19th and the first half of the 20th centuries. The century spanning the 1860s to the 1960s has been described by one of my colleagues, Charles Meyer, a historian of Europe, as an age of territoriality. This territorial principle was transplanted in the structure and form of states in Europe's colonies. But rival universalistic allegiances did not hold their, did not lose their hold on people's minds and may even have exercised greater appeal than before. If colonial empires globalized the nation state form, anti-colonial nationalists mounted their challenge on a global scale. For example, anti-colonial nationalism and Islamic universalism could be perfectly compatible in the early 20th century. The spirit of different universalism that appealed to anti-colonial nationalists may have been waterborne across the Indian Ocean, but was never quite defined by an expanse of water except in a metaphorical sense. So it is best not to exaggerate the contradiction between oceans and continents that has crept into some of the scholarly literature. The myth of continents has been subjected to a powerful enlightenment, for example, in a book by Karen Wigan and Martin Lewis, with some justice, as a meta-geographical concept hopelessly tainted by the hubris of European imperialism. The idea of Asia, however, as defined by Asians, was not a singular one, and had many variations, <coughs> as it had many individual authors. It was at variance with the concrete expression of Asia invented by 19th century European geographers and cartographers. And that is what has been debunked as the modern myth of continents. Now, there were strands within the Asian hot worlds that only inverted and did not undermine the Europe-Asia dichotomy, being content to invest the latter, that is Asia, with a higher order of value and virtue. That forms a less interesting dimension of the modern tug of war between Europe and Asia. Far more fascinating was the imagination of Asia as an abstract entity transcending the imperial and national frontiers being etched by colonial powers onto the physical and mental maps of the colonized, and thereby serving as a prism to, ref to refract the light of universal humanity. The own country or Swadeshi cultural milieu of early 20th century India, despite its interest in rejuvenating indigenous traditions, was not wholly inward looking. Its protagonists were curious about innovations in different parts of the globe and felt comfortable with an ever widening concentric circles of Bengali patriotism, Indian nationalism, and Asian universalism. Aspiring to reconcile a sense of nationality with a common humanity, they were not prepared to let colonial borders constrict their imaginations. The spirit of Asian universalism was brought to India by two turn-of-the-century ideologues, Okakura Kakuzo and Sister Nivedita. Okakura had been deeply influenced in his early years by the Harvard scholar of Japanese art, Ernest Francisco Fenolosa, whose collection of Japanese and Chinese paintings he later catalogued for the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Okakura's blend of Japanese nationalism and Asian universalism was appealing as a potential model for Indian intellectuals and artists in the very early 20th century. Okakura first came to India in 1902 on the eve of the publication of his book, The Ideals of the East, for which Sister Nivedita, the Irish-born disciple of the Hindu sage Swami Vivekananda, wrote an introduction. Once Sister Nivedita introduced Okakura to the Tagore clan, a formidable cultural bridge was established between East and South Asia, and Japanese artists Taikan Yokoyama and Shunso Ishida soon followed Okakura's trail to Calcutta. By observing Taikan, Obonindranath Tagore learned the Japanese wash technique, of, his, of which his famous painting Bharat Mata, Mother India, which you see on the screen, is a prominent example. 
Now, this is the iconic <coughs> image of Mother India, the nation as mother, but it was executed in the Japanese wash technique. The Japanese and the Chinese brush ending style was more deeply imbibed by Obodindranath's brother, Gobanindranath Tagore. And in Nandalal Bose's early masterpiece, Sati, 1907, a quintessentially Indian theme of selfless womanhood emerged in the colors and contours of the Japanese wash. This is the southern veranda, a sketch of the southern veranda of the Tagore mansion in Calcutta, where Okakura met the Indian intellectuals and artists. While the First World War raged in Europe and the Middle East, Rabindranath Tagore set off on a global oceanic voyage from Calcutta on May 3, 1916, aboard the Japanese ship Osama. Traveling on this easterly route for the first time in his life, Tagore made his first stop in Burma. From Burma, the Tosamaru traveled further east towards Penang, Singapore, and Hong Kong. The poet felt a sense of joy observing the strength and skill of Chinese laborers working at the port in Hong Kong and made an uncannily accurate prophecy about the future balance of power in the world. The nations which now own the world's resources, Tagore argued, fear the rise of China and wish to postpone the day of that rise. On May 29, 1916, the Tosamaru reached the Japanese port of Kobe. Tagore's three-month sojourn in Japan represented the fulfillment not just of a personal quest, but the search for an Asian universalism that had begun at the turn of the 20th century. Tagore's direct encounter with the power and scale of art in Japan during his 1916 visit led him to urge Indian artists to look east in order to pioneer a fresh departure from the Swadeshi corpus of ideas. Tagore was as impressed by the Japanese visual arts as he was unimpressed by Japan's tendency to imitate elements of European nationalistic imperialism. It was only after rebuking Japan on that count that Tagore undertook the long Pacific crossing to North America on September 7, 1916. While he was in Japan, Tagore had received an invitation to visit Vancouver. He flatly rejected it. Well aware of the Komagata Maru incident of 1914, when prospective Indian immigrants had been turned away from Vancouver Harbor, Tagore refused to travel to Canada and Australia until these dominions withdrew their discriminatory immigration policies. Ironically, the ship that took Tagore across the Pacific was named Canada Man. Tagore disembarked in Seattle, however, and journeying down the west coast of the USA, he delivered powerful strictures against worshiping the new god called nation in Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Pasadena. He then traveled from the west coast to the east, speaking out against nationalism during the presidential election season of 1916. Woodrow Wilson eked out a narrow victory, campaigning on the slogan, he kept us out of war. The nation with a capital L, Tagore declared in his speech titled The Cult of Nationalism in the Carnegie Hall of New York City in November 1916, with all its paraphernalia of power and prosperity, its flags and pious hymns, its blasphemous prayers in the churches and the literary mock thunders of its patriotic bragging <coughs> cannot hide the fact that the nation is the greatest evil for the nation, that all its precautions are against it, and any new birth of its fellow in the world is always followed in its mind by the dread of a new peril. So he asked Indian uh, patriots not to imitate European nationalism or the territorially bounded model of the nation state. <coughs> Yet Tagore's critique of nationalism was perfectly compatible with his own patriotic poetry. Tagore's anti-nation stance in America was a cause for some concern back in India to anti-colonial nationalists. Although Tagore's book Nationalism was not publicly